All right. Yeah. So um, I'd just like to get started by, I guess, traditionally thanking the organizers for this incredible opportunity. Um, I am so grateful um, for, for the chance to speak to you today. And I'm also grateful for your coming after um, such a great night last night. The videos were totally awesome. Um, so thanks for, for that entertainment. And so that's, that's the first point. Um, and the second point, and just like, I know there's a few sort of tired faces, so I'd just like to get us all started by saying, is everybody excited for the last day of the MOF conference? Right, one, two, three. Guys, that was terrible. That was rubbish, right? We can try it one more time. And bear in mind, this is your only chance to participate in this lecture. So you better make it a good one, right? Are we all excited for today? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, participation over. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thanks very much to, to Professor McQueen for the introduction today. Um, very grateful for that. Just like to highlight a couple of things. Um, one, I actually left academia and I was a school teacher for a year and taught A-level chemistry. Um, that taught me a number of things, one of which that kids can be extremely mean. So no matter what I get asked now in a lecture, I'm totally cool with that, right? I've had much, much worse. Um, and the second was, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of opportunities to go to different um, places around the world, which I'm grateful, um, including, of course, um, Kyoto with Satoshi Hariki and Suzuma Kitagawa, uh, Wuhan. Um, it's funny, no one knew where Wuhan really was four years ago, and now everybody knows where it is. Go figure. Wonder, wonder what happened there. Um, all right, so we'll dive straight in today, and we'll just attack the main question head on. What is an amorphous solid? Okay, I guess we're all pretty familiar with crystalline solids that we have short and long range order, right? We have an immediate coordination environment and that's repeated throughout our crystal and that gives rise to our beautiful MOF structures. For example, using a German analogy, right? Here we have some beautiful beer steins. Our short range order, right? We have the handles connected to the glass. The glass has some patterns on. It's filled with beer. The beer has a head. Wonderful, right? Wunderbar. That stein is our short range order, and that's connected, okay? And it's repeated throughout crystalline pattern. What about an amorphous system, right? An amorphous system, people say, has no order. Now, that's not actually correct, okay? It's not a question of order or disorder. It's a question of the length scale of order. So in an amorphous system, we have the same immediate coordination environment, um, but this time, they're not connected on a long range scale. There's no correlation. I can see you thinking, what analogy is going to happen here? This is the Guinness World Record. I looked this up for the number of steins carried by one person, right? 28 beer steins carried by this chap in one go. Right? An amazing achievement. The analogy here is that we still have our short range order. Constituents are still the same, but it's how they are stacked and connected and interact with one another that's different. And that also holds for amorphous systems. So where does a glass come in? Well, glasses are, are a category of amorphous solid. Okay, they're a type of an amorphous solid. Um, and they're really distinguished from a liquid state, usually when you cool it. When you cool a liquid, two things happen. The first thing that happens is you're removing heat. Things start slowing down. The second thing that's happening is your liquid's always trying to reach thermal equilibrium to reach its ground state. Okay, so when you deviate from that, when you're cooling faster than things can rearrange, that's when we get a glass. And the range over which that happens, that's a kinetic phenomenon. That's called the glass transition region. Okay, so we'll go from going from a solid or a frozen liquid, is what people would call glasses, to, um, to a liquid state. A bit more upon glasses, right? It's not just our architectural materials. It's not just building materials. It's not just these fancy cookware, right? but it's also display screens. They're all examples of inorganic glasses, but we can also have organic polymers with glass transitions, pharmaceutical packing, um, sort of labware, ceramics, etc. And we can also have metallic glasses, right? To cool metallic glasses, you need about 40,000 Kelvin per second cooling rate, right? Really, really quick. They were last discovered in the, the 1970s. Okay, so it took about 15, 20 years for application. 
but they can make excellent golf clubs for those who like golfing, all right, and surgical implements as well. I'm just going to show you um, a very, very short clip. Um, I will say this is a Corning clip. It's available on YouTube. Um, other glass industries are available. Just don't want to upset people. All right, think about the way in which you interact with glass on a daily basis and then start thinking to yourself, well, I wonder how moths might incorporate into this. So ceramics for your cooktops, type of glass, induction. You can have the glass cookware itself. You can have haptic technologies. Something to keep the kids importantly occupied in the car, although they've given the kid control of the car music there, so I'm not sure if that's a good idea. Education settings. We've got all these haptic um, interactive technologies. And then also in medical settings as well. Okay, so as you go around um, today, think about, well, I wonder what are the possibilities for using our chemical functionality, which we're familiar with, with physical properties and interesting glasses. Let's leave all that to one side. All right, forget about that for a minute. Well, don't forget, but put it in the back of your mind. I'm a material scientist. And so how I started off was thinking about MOFs as materials, not about chemical entities, this is just, this isn't a moth specific diagram. This is just a material um, and how it behaves. You apply stress, force over area, you do something to it. That could be uniaxial, it could be shearing, it could be torsion, it could be impact, it could be bending. And what happens is there's a region where whatever you do to your material, it expands or it contracts, and that's elastic, Hooke's law. It comes back to its original. After that, you get some plastic behavior. The material is still sort of intact, but it's deformed irreversibly. And then we get failure. Okay, so a lot of the work in my group is, well, what happens when moths fail? Right? What are the opportunities? Where's the elastic region? Where's the plastic region? And what happens after a moth fails or a moth dies? It's funny, we have such a fantastic array of materials in our world, um, in the moth world, over 100,000 but we don't really know anything about their physical properties. And so this is where many of the opportunities come. Uh, some wonderful work done by Adam Satnick has been looking at shear induced collapse. So what happens when you apply stresses sort of like this on a moth? Um, Adam chose MIL-100. MIL-100 is a fantastically um, complicated system, but you wish he hadn't chose that now, but he did. Um, composed of iron oxide trimers connected by um, benzene tricarboxate ligands, so there's one building unit, higher order super tetrahedra, and then an even higher order cage system. What Adam found is actually when you ball mill it, so when you apply shear stress, it collapses very quickly from our Bragg diffraction into something which is amorphous, so no Bragg diffraction. Adam then integrated the intensity of these peaks and found sort of a rough measure of crystallinity after one minute, things are sort of stable in terms of your crystallinity, and then it collapses very quickly to 10 minutes. And it's really interesting to note that that is slightly at odds with its gasorption behavior. This is N2 gasorption, where after one minute, most of it's already lost. So there's definitely a disconnection between crystallinity and properties. Adam then went one step further, trying to think, well, what is that amorphous material? So use pair distribution function work, uh, distance in R, angstroms along the bottom, um, and then when we see peak, two atoms connected by the peak. Some beautiful work by Adam integrated each of these peaks over the ball milling time, so over this progressive collapse, um, and then looked at their intensity. And actually, the intensities fall into three categories. One is the, uh, the trimer, right? That really doesn't change at all, so that's present in the system. The second category, which undergoes some collapse, is this medium range order in the tetrahedra. And then finally, it's only our long range order, which is completely lost. So inside um, that amorphous system, we still have some of the constituent building blocks of our moth. That's great, because it's given rise to some beautiful work by researchers in this field. For example, um, Thomas Lars Frisic has shown that amorphous systems can be intermediates in uh, recrystallization of different moths. Right? We can recrystallize these into different structures because our components are still there. Uh, Satoshi Yurike over in Kyoto has done some beautiful work on ball milling um, coordination polymers 
ensuring that when you ball mill them, when you form the amorphous equivalent, that they actually have higher proton conductivities. Um, Kruno over in Croatia has shown work on the catalytic ability in MOF74 systems. So these MOF74 systems are actually more catalytically active when you've amorphized them. And David Fer and Jimenez in Cambridge has shown beautiful work trapping drug molecules inside crystalline systems, which suffer from burst release. But when you trap a drug molecule and then you amorphize it, it actually slows down the release rapidly. Right? So I'm using this, this um, lecture as an opportunity not only to present the work from my own group and students, but also to show you the wider implications and what other people are doing with the research. All right, that, that's it for shear induced collapse. So let's move on to hydrostatic pressure induced amorphization. All right, we can shear things or we can just try and squeeze them. Um, this is excellent work done by Karina Chapman way back in 2009, um, before we'd started thinking about this pressure amorphization. And what Karina did was use a diamond anvil cell. So two diamonds pointing into some solvent, your MOF, everyone's favorite MOF, CIF8, um, in the middle. And then when you squeeze the diamonds together, you apply pressure to the MOF system itself. Karina showed that um, actually in 1.2 gigapascals, that's not that high pressure, that's irreversible amorphization. Whatever you've done by squeezing that MOF, it's not coming back. So then um, she went on and she did some beautiful research on trapping iodine within a crystalline system, then ball milling it, very quickly amorphizing it and preventing the iodine from leaving. So that's kind of trapping guests within MOF systems. So no FX could has actually shown um, the mechanism of collapse of these ZIFs is usually via shear collapse again, even though we're applying uni um, hydrostatic compression, it's always in our um, systems, one elastic um, tensor that seems to drop off more. Our own work has been on the UIO66 systems and again, treating them as materials, you know, when do they collapse and what can we do about their collapse? Okay, what opportunities does it have? So in these UIO66 materials, and this is with Ross Forgan, Stephen Mogak, Tina June, and Claire Hobday, um, Ross synthesized a UIO67 uh, material uh, with a planar linker, and then also this functionalized um, equivalent, this azobenzene dicarboxylate. The average crystal structures look about the same. They're in gray here from single crystal. You can see that it's planar linker between the nodes. But when you do some MD simulations and take a snapshot, the UIO66 uh, linker is absolutely planar. That for that azobenzene one is not the way it lies out of the plane. And so that means when we're looking at a snapshot of where those linkers are, they're actually bowing out of the plane. You might think, oh, well, that's really good. But I mean, come on, Tom. I mean, we've come to, it's quarter past nine, we've got up, you know, and you're telling us, well, that's great, great structural work, but what does it mean? Well, actually, um, when you compress these, UIO67 dies, right? We love killing moths in my group. Um, UIO67 dies very quickly, but the functionalized version does not. And that's really because this link of bowing is enabling the structure to accommodate more strain before collapse. So if we're designing pressure resistant moths, flexibility is a very good thing indeed. Rigidity is perhaps not. Just like to take the opportunity to mention um, beautiful work done by Sven Rogger and Veronique van Speerbroek uh, in really trying to computationally elucidate at which pressure do things collapse. And I think if we're really looking at building structure property relationships, then work like this is going to be incredibly useful in, um, in further exploring the mechanics of MOFs. Our own work, and this is beautiful stuff done by George Robertson um, in the group in collaboration with Omar Farhar's group, at Northwestern has been on really trying to apply lots of pressure, right, again, um, to MOFs. UIO66 dies, I'd say around 28 gigapascals. I think, well, what is 28 gigapascals? 28 gigapascals is about the pressure you'd reach 2,100 kilometers below the Earth's crust, right? So we're talking an awful lot of pressure, right? We really did want to kill this. Um, fine. But other systems like NU1000, which we might expect are less stable, are actually more so. Right? We can take NU1000, 
to seven or eight gigapascals. In black is at room pressure, at red is in situ, and at blue is our recovered sample. Eight gigapascals is fine, but that seems to be the limit of elasticity because when we go beyond that, we see um, back at room pressure, a different structure emerge. Right, so this is the latest work coming out of the group. It's Georgie's um, latest research, but it just gives you an idea of how little we actually know about mobs. The other thing which we're really interested in are um, not only killing beautiful systems, right? We're not just moth killers, we also make them. And so um, Adam is, again has looked at this beautiful MIL-100 system. Unfortunately, as beautiful as though it is, you have to form it over about 24 hours of dropwise addition, right? So that scale-up could be a problem for industry, but beautiful structure, right? Everyone's happy, great, brilliant. Gives rise to a bragged fraction pattern. Everyone's thinking, yep, yeah, that looks great. However, it does have an amorphous equivalent, FEBTC, which Stefan Kaskill published on in 2009. This amorphous equivalent is commercially active, uh, commercially available. It's catalytically active. It's cheap. It's easy to scale up, and you can form it at room temperature under one hour. But for some reason, we're just not interested in the structure. Why is that? It doesn't seem to me to be an actual reason for this distinction. Crystalline, great, wonderful. Amorphous, very functional, cheap, not wonderful. And as a material scientist, I rely on structure property relationships. If we know the structure, we can correlate it to a property, and then we can change the structure and look at the change in property. How can we ever expect to make better materials if we don't know the structure of these things? So Adam dived right in, uh, this time in collaboration with Kim Jelfs and Irene Beckis in Imperial College London. And we took some PDF data, as we do. The um, blue trace is our crystalline MIL-100, and the orange one up here is our FEBTC. Obviously, the, um, the FEBTC has no long-range order, so we see no peaks out at high R. But at short-range order, these two are very much similar. And Adam managed to predict the PDFs of what this trimer would like, the basic building block of MIL-100, what the super tetrahedra would look like, and of course, we know that it has BTC in. So after confirming those building units are present in our amorphous equivalent, we then turn to computational help through this polymatic polymerization algorithm. I'm not going to say that one again. Um, and this is essentially connecting things and making a polymer. The original use for organic polymer structure prediction. We can combine um, these different blocks and different models. So for example, just taking the trimer in BTC produces an amorphous model with a low surface area. Combining the super tetrahedra with BTC produces a model with relatively high surface area, although most of it is inaccessible. And it's only when you mix the two in 50% equivalents, you form an amorphous system with some trimers, some super tetrahedra, do you get something which resembles your experimental result? Uh, so there's a simplified amorphous model right, with different things represented by simple geometric um, symbols. And the reason why I've done that is because that's our amorphous configuration. I'm sure you'll appreciate that's actually quite hard to visualize. So not nearly as pretty as MIL-100, I accept that, but this is actually much more functional and cheaper than MIL-100. Great, again, you know, you might think that that's kind of nice, but what's the relevance for application? Well, MIL-100, can't discriminate between things like propane and propane, right? The structure's too big, no discrimination. But when we introduce this structural disorder, this is FEBTC, now we suddenly start seeing possibilities for application, right? This is functional performance through disorder. Right? It's that structural disorder which is giving us some functionality. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've done shear-induced collapse, killing moths. We've done pressure-induced collapse, killing moths. We've done um, directly synthesized amorphous moths. And it would be interesting to know how many equivalents like MIL-100 FEBTC there are out there. I think a lot. But the rest of this lecture is going to sort of tiptoe around um, the glasses and the liquids that we've been forming in the group. 
So the gases and the liquids um, were kind of discovered simultaneously with um, my good friend Satoshi Urike in Kyoto. He was working on 1D coordination polymers in, don't know why I decided I didn't want to walk across there, but I don't, so I'll stick on this side. Yeah, both done in 2015. We were looking at three-dimensional MOFs. Um, and the reason why we got into this was I was looking at the thermal stability, right? What happens when we thermally kill a moth? Right, so we made a beautiful crystal. It's as if it didn't really matter what it was at the time. We were just interested in the thermal collapse and thermal behavior. And then we thought we'll, we'll analyze its thermal stability. So we took a TGA. And we took a TGA, that's brilliant. It's a constant rate experiment. And we, um, we looked and said, well, that's solvent loss. Here's a beautiful plateau. That means the molecules, um, the, the MOF, sorry, is stable to 450 degrees. Yeah, great job. Let's go home. No, no team, it's not, it's not. It's, um, it's actually, this is a rubbish experiment for a number of reasons, right? The first reason, what happens when you heat this material to 200 degrees for four hours? What happens when you heat it to 270 for nine hours? What happens when you heat it to 350 for 30 minutes? Right, what happens when you use air, when you use nitrogen, when you use argon? Right, this experiment tells you nothing about that. So to start thinking about the thermal stability of MOFs and these have exceptionally high thermal stabilities with just a TGA, you know, that really needs looking at in this field. The second reason, however, why this is just a, a poor assumption is because TGAs tell you nothing about phase transitions which are not accompanied by mass loss, right? No mass loss, TGA is going to be flat, right? It's the very definition. When we do a DSC, so when you look at the heat um, difference between your sample and a reference, you actually see a beautiful melting peak in a plateau. And upon reheating, this wonderful glass transition behavior that I talked about on one of the first few slides. And so the material is not a white powder. It's not white microcrystalline anymore, but it's this beautiful glass. Alice Bumstead in the group has done some beautiful work functionalizing the glasses. So we can make new ZIFs with things like amino benzimidazole um, ligands in them, giving them a nice red color. They melt at around similar temperatures, around 350. And importantly, your carbon dioxide uptake at very low pressures is about half that of the crystalline equivalent. All right, so we're not actually looking at these glasses to store carbon dioxide, but in terms of separation, this should now get people thinking. Why did Alice choose amino benzimidazole to functionize? Well, glass functionalization is incredibly important. When we look at the windows, that's not just one block of glass. When we look at our iPad screens, it's not just one block of solid glass. These are multi-layered systems, and with these composite materials, it's the interface which is really important. If the interface is weak, your material fails. Your display screen, it, um, it suffers from aberration problems, et cetera. So after making this amino um, functionalized glass on the surface, Alice did a really simple experiment. Um, PSM has been known in MOFs through Seth Cohen and Joe Hupps and Omar Farhaw's work for a while now. And just stuck on a long chain uh, alkyl group. Now that's fantastic because Alice managed to change the surface chemistry from hydrophilic, which we all know is a bit of an Achilles heel in the moth world, to hydrophobic. Right? So depending on what you want for your glass surface, you've got some opportunities through PSM. How does all of that melting happen? You know, what is the mechanism of thermal collapse? Well, that's through um, known through FX's great work in 2017, where we're heating a system the weakest bond, in this case, the zinc midazole bond, breaks at high temperature, and then it's replaced by another one coming in. Um, MOFs, quite amazingly, obey the same melting laws as inorganics. So this is Lindemann's law, uh, or his criterion. I think it was about 20, uh, 2016, 1906. Yeah, 1906 when that was published. Um, F is U over D. U is how much your ligand is moving and D is the distance between that ligand and its coordination environment. So essentially, when your ligand's librating, it's moving very quickly, then you're liable to get melting, and that holds true for MOF systems as well. I'm showing you many um, sort of atomistic configurations, but I haven't told you how that we produce them. So most of them are through reverse Monte Carlo modeling of PDF data done with Andrew Goodwin and David Keane. 
Essentially, you collect PDF data. You guess at a starting model, pick a model from somewhere. One atom, you move from that starting model. You compare your new data to your experimental. And if the, if the agreement is better, you accept. If it's worse, you reject. So evidently, with uh, a glass ziff, the first thing you do is think, OK, well, I'm going to take a crystalline one. But in actual fact, it doesn't matter how many you take or which ones you take, you can't reproduce the experimental data. The only way in which you can do that is by taking an old model for silica glass, for pure SiO2, for replacing the silicon with zinc, replacing the oxygen with imidazolate, um, and then expanding it slightly. And once you do that, you come up with a configuration which has an excellent agreement to your experimental data. And that's why we're so comfortable in calling these glasses a hybrid equivalent of amorphous silica. And so the glass world's now recognized hybrid glasses is a fourth category of glass and the first um, nonsense metallic glasses in the 1970s. Adam Sapnik and, um, and Alice this time combined to show some mathematical techniques for the, attacking this question of order disorder length scale. So what they've done here is followed melting of a different system from its crystalline uh, material to its liquid and simply um, taken all of that data and used principal component analysis, which is a mathematical technique to just break it down into two components. So we can make any of this experimental data, any of the enormous number of points, just by combining two data sets together in different proportions. And what we find is um, the weighting at room temperature is mostly this first component, that's mostly the crystalline one. But as we increase the temperature, the weighting of that one goes down and the weighting of the second component, remember this is a mathematical um, process, goes up. You can start breaking that down further into different length scales. And what you realize is on the short range order, nothing really changes. But what is changing is the way in which these building units are interacting with each other. So we get a lot more variance in the higher degrees of ordering, but it does mean that our initial coordination environments are still present. So that's great. And you might think, OK, well, you've shown us all these different ways of melting. So let's just go out and let's melt everything. Right? And I was really excited. And my group will tell you, I do try and melt everything, um, which is fun. I do chocolate polymorphism when I'm doing outreach for schools, which is a fantastic experiment. Um, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that, sadly, and perhaps familiar to all of us researching. It's just not quite as easy as one would hope. Sorry, my little Britney Spears headset's coming off. Right, there we go. Um, Ziff 8 doesn't melt. Everybody's favorite Ziff doesn't melt. That's a huge disaster, right? Not in terms of application, but in terms of interest. Once you say, well, Ziff 8 doesn't melt, everyone sort of turns off, mm, done. The reason why it doesn't melt is because when you're detaching that ligand, the ligand's free in the system and it has nothing to stabilize it. No non-covalent no, no non interactions. But we can leverage that. We can see, okay, porous systems don't melt. Dense systems, like these hybrid perovskites, right? It's still a moffy type of system. Uh, manganese octahedra, dicyanamide ligands with um, uh, ammonium cation. These actually melt at around 200 degrees, so even lower. Right? Hybrid perovskites are kind of another hot material, rivaling moths for this everybody loves them status. But we can show that these melt. We can also cheat the system. We can cheat this density relationship. And this was done by Josh um, in my group with Fahid and Lothar in um, the University of Vienna, not, not too far from here. ZIF-62 melts, but it's quite dense. As soon as we move away from that, more open systems don't melt. Right? We love poor systems in this audience. Um, so how can we force these to melt? Well, the idea is that we artificially increase the density by loading them with this ionic liquid, all right? That's ethyl methylimidazole bis trifluorosulfonamide. I've not made life easy for myself this morning with some of these, some of these names. Um, anyway, we load it with an ionic liquid at, um, and look at the stability of this dissociated ligand, how it changes when there's something else in your pole. And in our case, it works a treat, all right? From going from a non-melting system now we can make beautiful glasses from ZIF-8 and higher order systems. But the warning and the health warning that comes with this is that you still have some of your ionic liquid inside. 
the system's melting because your ligand, when it's dissociated, is somehow being stabilized by your ionic liquid fragments. But the glass, which is left over, is very complicated to analyze indeed, as some of this um, MS data showed. OK, all right, so that's a break from temperature-induced collapse. It's a break from shear-induced collapse. It's a break from hydrostatic pressure-induced collapse. It's away from directly synthesized amorphous systems. So what happens if we make things even more complicated and we combine two of these variables? Right, these are the first sort of known, I'm going to say, pressure temperature phase diagrams, and I'll tell you why I've done that in a minute, um, done by Remo Vidma um, and others. This was in collaboration with the Atomic Weapons Establishment in the UK, so that was very exciting indeed. Um, essentially, we apply pressure and temperature at the same time. This is really widely known in the inorganic world. Right? Geologists do this all the time to look at different polymorphs. So why don't we do it with MOFs? Well, beautiful work from Sebastian Henk has showed that with increasing pressure, we get different ZIF systems. Right? And that's true for other MOFs also. We've shown with increasing temperature, we get amorphization, recrystallization, and melting. So what about pressure and temperature? Well, the two things to point out on this, um, this graph are, one, we can form weird exotic phases. Right, where we can't form them under ambient conditions. So that's pretty neat, right? New moth discovery. And the other one is this melting slope. That's positive, right? So melting gets harder with pressure. The reason why melting gets harder with pressure, dp over dt is del s over del v. That's a Clapeyron relation. Entropy change from solid to liquid, it's positive. Volume change from a dense moth to a liquid is positive. So that slope's positive. Great. But we can play around with that and we can stop recrystallization with heating. So instead, we just go from a crystalline system to a high temperature amorphous one to melting straight away, right? No collapse into a dense state. That gives us really interesting behavior because now we're going from open MOF, metastable, right? This is why I talked about the diagrams overleaf as being phase diagrams because it isn't the thermodynamically stable phase. MOFs are all metastable because when we make them, they have solvent in, we remove the solvent, it's not the same material. So we can do this, and actually this slope has now changed from positive to negative. Why has it done that? And that's very unusual behavior indeed. It's known, I think, for liquid gallium and water. Well, that's known because now we're collapsing from an open system to a liquid, that volume change is now negative. Okay, so that gives us this beautiful negative slope. Or if we approach it from the high pressure dense amorphous phase, we go back to positive. Other groups have done some fantastic work building on these initial discoveries with MOF glasses. And these include um, groups of Sebastian Henk um, from Yang Shu Lee, um, and also from Matt Cowan, uh, Dana Stone, who give a fantastic talk here, really on trying to build membranes. Right? Why would you want to build a membrane from a MOF glass? Well, glasses don't have grain boundaries. There are no grain boundary defects. As soon as you have a grain boundary material science, you have a problem. So they have tried to show this, and they've done this by um, Sebastian looked at ZIF, ZIF glasses, being able to separate different isomers of hydrocarbons. And then um, Yuang Shuo Li has shown that a membrane formed from ZIF-62 actually performs really well in terms of CO2, N2 selectivity. So I'm really excited to see more work in this area and more work on looking at glasses from a porous materials point of view. But of course, we can also look at the glasses from a glass point of view. Um, why are MOF glasses useful? Why are they good? Why are industry excited? Well, the reason why some industries are excited is because they don't recrystallize. Inorganic glasses recrystallize upon heating. I'm nervously looking over because I'm keeping everyone on time. Good. Yeah, Wendy's saying, yeah, you're good. Hi, Wendy. Um, yeah, they don't recrystallize. And they don't recrystallize because you're going from an open system to a dense liquid. There's no thermodynamic driving force for recrystallization. So that's one good reason. And the other one is their mechanical properties. Inorganic glasses are brittle. We know if we drop our phone screen, it will crack. Organics are ductile. But organics, you can scratch really easily. So an ideal glass would be one in which you combine the, um, the strength of an inorganic and the scratch resistance with the ductility of an organic. 
our work on MOFs have really shown that they lie in the middle. That's great because we always talk about MOFs as being hybrid in terms of their functionality, but now we're showing that they're hybrid in terms of their glass behavior. Okay, so this is all complicated problems. So what do we do? We make things even more complicated, right? My students really do love me, love me for this, by combining different materials into one, into a composite. So with inorganics, we can try and, um, and produce more fracture resistant phone screens by taking it inorganic glass, melting it with an MOF glass, and then we actually find that our mechanical properties are modified. I'm gonna quickly tell you why I've put an iPhone there, right? This was on purpose, this was petulance on my behalf. I bought a new Samsung Galaxy, right? S22, great camera. My, my old one, it was absolutely hammered, it was broken. Right, I came here, I went to plug in my headphones on the plane next to someone really noisy. It's got no headphone jack, I feel like a dinosaur. Yeah, absolute dinosaur, so iPhone, there we go. Um, great, I'll collect my commission from Apple later. Um, but the crux is you can soften inorganic glasses by melting them with moths and that's work. Beautiful work done by Ashley Chester and the group who's here and Louis. We can also try the same trick with crystalline moths. Why aren't we trying to imbue glasses, which are used worldwide for lots of different things, with the functionality of a crystalline moth? This is work um, done by Thelia Castillo-Blas in the group and Ashley again. Um, please do go and talk to them about it. You can see some amazing results. Or we can combine a moth glass with a moth. Right? Those are, these are two hybrid systems which bond well at the interface. And in this case, beautiful work done by Jingwei and Chris Ashling has shown you can take MIL-53, um, reference to Christian Cern and um, the late Gerard Ferrer there, and MIL-53 expands at high temperature and collapses. Trap it within a moth glass, it remains in its high temperature open state, so you get a better gas absorption from these. I promise you I'm going through these quickly. This is the last scientific slide. Um, work by Jingwei Ho in the University of Queensland and Sean Collins, who's in Leeds now in the UK, is showing you can try the same trick. So stabilizing metastable materials by encapsulating them within a hybrid glass. In this case, we've chosen cesium lead iodide, the perovskite, room temperature, it's in a yellow phase, it's a non-perovskite phase, and only at high temperature do you see conversion to a cubic photoluminescent system. Same trick, melt it with a moth glass, and actually what you can do is instead of it reverting to its room temperature non-perovskite phase, you trap it in one of these photoluminescent black phases, and you can play around with the chemistry to make these beautiful photoluminescent glasses here. Yeah. So in conclusion, what I'd say is, um, you know, disorder can be extremely useful, right? It's not totally disordered. It's a question of where that disorder lies on the length scale. And I'd also say it's really cool to see in inorganics, organics, and uh, hybrids, our development from making amorphous functional things to suddenly trying to crystallize everything. And then now we're seeing some beautiful work come out on porous liquids from Andy Cooper and Stuart James, um, and on liquid things like liquid mops from Shuai Furukawa in Kyoto. And if you should be able to make a liquid, there's a chance you can make a glass. And also driving towards different methods of forming glasses. It's not just by melting. The in inorganic world's been used to making sol gel hybrid glasses for a long time. And that's what Ayano and Kono, who's here today, is working on. So please ask her. Yeah, so I'm just really, really excited to see where the field's going. I'm super excited to see since my talk in 20, 2014 now, um, as a young trembling student, now I'm a young trembling um, PI, um, all of this beautiful work from all of these people now coming out in the amorphous moth world. I really do think it's a huge opportunity for people to get involved in. And um, I'd really encourage those of you looking um, at some amorphous systems, please do get in touch, right? I just really want to help um, grow this area of moth science. I think far from being tapped out, this field's only getting going. Um, yeah, and I just really like to say once again, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. It's been an honor. I'm very grateful. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I hope you continue to enjoy yourselves. And none of this work would be possible without my fantastic group to whom I'm extremely grateful, to my excellent collaborators, um, to the funders. These are the group members um, present. So please do go and talk to them. And yeah, um, constructive, constructive criticism, right? Use the compliment sandwich. Um, on Twitter or by my email. And just thank you once again so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.
Thanks so much for a really nice talk. Okay, so questions. Here. Hi, Thomas. Uh, yeah, spectacular lecture as always. Um, I was wondering, do you, did you have any evidence of um, some kind of polymorphism of a morphous form, similarly to what we have in, uh, for instance, I saw as I'm aware in pharmaceutical compounds, we have like different amorphous forms. I don't know how they characterize them, of course, but. Do, do you know what, Stefano? That is a fantastic question. The question of polyamorphism. Polyamorphism is hotly debated about in the, in the glass world. I mean, people really get very excited and animated when debating it. For example, people arguing about um, different states of liquid water, even. Um, I think it's problematic for several reasons. We have seen evidence that you can form amorphous phases with different densities, and we know you can do that through um, the glass transition and playing around with it. So yes, there is room for looking at that. Equally interesting would be the questions, what's the difference between a pressurized amorphous phase, between a ball milled amorphous phase and a glass phase itself? Right? But the techniques which you're talking about there to try and distinguish are very complicated indeed. So I think I'd be led by the properties of them in that case. For example, much like what the, um, the glass world is led by. Right? How can we process, can we cool faster and make more open systems, for example? It's an absolutely fascinating question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Like a, a very small follow-up. Um, did you ever seen any uh, evidence of um, some long-range directionality in the structure of a glass, like some sort of preferential orientation of amorphous features? I guess it's a weird no. question. No, okay. I'm going to... No, but we can chat about it later. Evidence from one-dimensional PDF. For sure. Right. Yeah, no, but we could chat about that later. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We have time for one more short question. Anybody? I can't really see well because of the lights. Is there, no? you have one step on? Yeah, maybe a follow-up question to this. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation. And I think many of the glass properties and, and glass states are history dependent states. And, um, and I'm also always wondering how we can distinguish one glass from the other or one amorphous solid from the other. I mean, that's the beauty of the crystal structures. You can say it's DUT 49, it's DUT 8 or something like this. And But for the glass, it's always the challenge. So um, do you think there is a chance maybe connecting these new activities towards digitalization, electronic lab books that basically record all the history of your preparations and, and, and states to... Um, define new labels or yeah, something that can uniquely identify a certain material for the future. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really great point. Um, with melt quench classes in, in particular, their properties are incredibly dependent upon their thermal history. What you've done to the glass will affect how dense it is, perhaps how um, the length scale on which things are ordered or disordered. If you are making amorphous materials, each method of making it will cause a different material to evolve than another. So accurate recording of exactly how you've done it is absolutely vital in trying to reproduce those results. Right? Remember these configurations which I'm showing you, we can't say that is the structure of an amorphous material. We can say that's how best we represent the average. Um, and on top of that, we could even start thinking about introducing defects into amorphous materials through different processing. Right, so the world of connecting defects and this idea of extreme disorder is just a whole new ball game again, which would re require even more careful analysis of your preparation techniques. Indeed. Thank you. Yeah.